Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking briefly about GN getting back into ITX case reviews. We're really excited about that. We'll also be talking about the ASUS ROG Ally finally getting an official comment from ASUS about the overheating SSD issue. And by overheating, we mean sometimes they melt. Additionally, Intel's 14th gen CPUs are supposed to have more cores than typically, uh, maybe moving away from the Intel quad core that's been around forever at this point. And in some other news, Acer has a Radeon GPU that we can't talk about. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. Up first, this is just to put it on your radar, but we've been working on getting back into ITX case reviews. We did these a number of years ago. Uh, likely you're familiar with our ATX case reviews where we standardize everything, we test with a known set of hardware, and we run basically a fixed set of tests every time with some modifications that allow for certain customizations that the case may offer. But there aren't that many with ATX, and generally speaking, the same set of hardware works great in basically every case as long as the case is designed well, and that's the point of it. ITX has always been challenging. Years ago when we did some ITX reviews in a roundup, we standardized, and the reason we kind of got out of them for a while is because it's difficult to standardize with ITX where there's not as much of a standard. I, the sizes range from something like 10 liters, like the Fractal 10 point something, uh, up to an 011 mini ITX case where it's basically ATX just really small or ITX just really big. And so standardizing for a small downdraft cooler in a large case isn't fair to that case and obviously eliminating cases that are small because the cooler we chose doesn't fit isn't nice either. We finally kind of figured it out. We're going to be talking about this more in a standalone ITX testing methodology video, but uh, it's going to be a good amount of work where we have a rotating set of hardware depending on what we are testing for ITX cases. And then we have head-to-head -head comparisons and A-B comparisons we're going to be doing with those sets of hardware on almost a one-off or a case-by-case -case literally basis. So anyway, that's all coming up. We're excited about it. The first one's in the works, and the first one is the Fractal Terra. Just happened to launch right around when we wanted to get back into ITX, and um, that's coming up soon. So uh, keep an eye out for that. I don't know, next couple weeks sometime will be when we're starting to publish the methodology piece. We're working on the testing software I'm building right now uh, and some of the other features we need in the methodology for the, um, for the testing of the cases. Now, as for another quick update on our side of things, we just finished signing a bunch of the mod mats. So we announced last week that we have a special version of the autographed mod mats that's both types of medium and the large where it will have three signatures if you order a signed one. That'll be mine, Vitaly's, and Mike's. The three of us have never signed anything together before like this, and we did it to commemorate that massive AMD documentary, and that video has been picking up views a lot over the last week, so thank you to everyone who's watched it because it was really fun and the response has been phenomenal. So until that stock of autographed mats runs out, purchases featuring the autographed ones will have all three signatures. And we've actually even gotten some emails and tweets from people who have gotten their first pinout cards and PCIe pins. And we're thrilled to see the response to that as well. So thank you everyone for supporting us by buying stuff from store.gamersnexus.net because that has helped pay for the massive AMD documentary and it's helping fund our next one. And I can't go into too much detail yet, but the next one is going to be a fab. We haven't been in one before, as in a silicon fabrication facility. And that means we get to see how CPUs are made down at the silicon level. Really excited about it. We have a pretty good amount of access where we can show all kinds of stuff and some things that haven't been shown before from this particular facility. So I want to stop the, the teaser there. Really super excited about it though. Uh, but that's the next one we're putting our effort into. And just like the AMD one, we are funding all of it 
with purchases from store.gamersnexus.net and from Patreon support at patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Okay, let's get into the news item for the Asus ROG Ally. So you have likely seen the ROG Ally had some SD card melting or overheating concerns. We mentioned briefly that we were going to look into it for our thermal testing part of the Ally review that we're still working through. Uh, however, Asus has finally put out some kind of statement. It's been a while. And this is what they said, quote, after confirmation from internal testing, under certain thermal stress conditions, the SD card reader may malfunction. To alleviate the issue, we'll be releasing an update that further fine tunes the default and minimum fan speeds on the device to improve reliability while keeping fan noise in check. As we know, this is a concern for many of you. So this is kind of the direction we were gonna go with the thermal testing, and we're still doing this, by the way, just as a validation, because especially now that there's going to be a fan speed change, we, uh, we'll see how long they take to ship this update, but if it's done before we're 100% locked in on our review, we'll go back and retest it with the update to look at the updated thermals and look at the increased fan noise, because it will increase. That's the natural outcome of increasing the speed, especially of a tiny fan. But either way, the SD card reader is very close to power delivery components on the PCB, and things like VRM components or charging components especially get very hot. The Steam Deck, when we tested it, uh, its hottest area on the PCB was that charging port when it was active and being used. And that's probably what's going on here as well. If they are running fan speeds too low, because for example, maybe the actual APU isn't getting that hot, so they're not spinning that fast, but the SD card is being pinned enough and the power delivery is running warm enough that it hits or exceeds 85C, then the fan's not gonna spin fast enough to keep up because the fan doesn't follow the SD card temperature or the slot temperature, it follows the APU temperature. This is a problem we've talked about with GPUs where when EVJ introduced ICX, it kind of made sense because if you have your fans follow the temperature of the GPU only, and if the heatsink is sufficient that under a minimal or moderate load, the heatsink itself can handle most of the heat without much spin up from the fans, then your other components that are uh, not directly attached to that heatsink, for example, or don't benefit from the airflow in the same way, like memory or MOSFETs, those will end up overheating. And this kind of happened with the ACX coolers we talked about years ago at this point. And it's the same concept here. Now, luckily, you don't have to wait for an official update from ASUS to set your own fan curve if you have one. So you can look into that if you want to err on the side of caution. Tom's Hardware pointed out that SanDisk rates its SD cards for operation up to 85 degrees Celsius, which could be the real concern in a tight area with no airflow right beside some power stages. ASUS is offering support to affected users of the Ally. They said this, quote, if you are currently experiencing issues with your SD card reader, please contact this email address or contact customer service for your region to arm your unit, which will inspect for any issues and repair. Now, by the time this news video goes up, we're probably going to be in the production stage of our ASUS Ally review. Uh, Patrick's just finished all the testing. It's coming to me next to wire up for thermocouples, run the thermal testing and the acoustic testing, and then we'll be finalizing the writing and sending it out the door. So ASUS has a couple days here to ship that update. Maybe by the time this video has gone up, they have, at which point we'll kind of uh, revert back and test that. Up next, Intel. There's been a cluster of YouTube getting real nervous right now. I said, I said the word cluster, and it's it's got a demonetization trigger ready. The leaks have been about Intel's Raptor Lake S 14th gen CPUs. The details are all over the place, but we'll cover a few of the potentially more credible points. First off, Enthusiastic Citizen made a text post on Billy Billy detailing launch dates in October for the unlocked k -SKU CPUs and January 2024 for non-K. Now this on its own sounds pretty realistic because Intel has frequently launched CPUs in October. Actually, I think the 8700K was around that time frame, And then it regularly launches the non-K and lower end i3 type CPUs following in January around CES. So the timing makes a lot of sense here. Uh, now, as for what these CPUs are, it's a refresh of the existing 13th gen parts. The top end core counts will have to remain the same but lower down the stack, there's room for increase. User Enthusiastic Citizen claims that the 14700K is likely to have 8P cores and 12E cores. That's a configuration we haven't seen yet. So that'd be 
different and worthy of testing. Backing this up are a couple of posts on Twitter from WXNOD and Harukazi5719 showing screenshots of a system allegedly running benchmarks on a 14700K and a confirmation of the core counts if that screenshot is to be believed. Other rumors like those from Red Gaming Tech claim core count boosts throughout the generation showing P cores for the i3s and 8P plus 8E for the i5s. This is the kind of thing that generally doesn't need a leaker to speculate about it, as it would make sense for Intel to offer more capable products in the new generation with higher core counts, just like with 13th gen. However, if all of this is true, it would basically mean the death of Intel's quad-core CPUs, which have been around forever at this point, because Intel's mainstream Core iX lineup, or soon moving to just Core X, no more I, uh, will be shifting to these higher core counts and things like the 12100 and the 13100, while actually pretty competitive, especially the 12100 at its price, uh, it, they're not going to keep scaling forever as the core count demand eventually starts to climb on more and more modern games. And we started to see some of that in the 12100F review, where in some games it struggles a little bit more than in others, especially with frame time pacing. But for the most part, they've been pretty consistent as budget options it's just now it might be finally moving on. Going back to the Enthusiastic Citizen post, there's a couple more points worth detailing. The rumor claims that existing motherboard BIOSes will be able to power on the refresh chips without an update, which that's nice, except for the new 8P plus 12E configuration. Beyond that, the post mentioned that there's no update for Arrow Lake beyond what's already out there. Namely, it's supposed to be on a new LGA 1851 socket and rumored to have up to 32 e-cores. Up next, Acer is getting ready to bring its first retail AMD GPU to the market uh, via the RX 7600. This will be for the DIY market, not just for its OEM pre-built. Acer has been pushing very hard lately to get into the DIY market. The Orion X that we saw at Computex, for example, will be available not only as a mini ITX pre-built, but also as a mini ITX case. It's one of the many on the list that we hope to get around to reviewing. Uh, but for GPUs, so the 7600, it's not been officially announced by Acer as of filming this, but X Fastest has a post showing it. And we saw it uh, back in early June or late May. So we can confirm it's definitely a thing. The card is another of the Bifrost design like Acer's A770 Bifrost before it. It has both an axial and a radial fan. Our full review on the A770 Bifrost showed that while the cooling setup wasn't anything groundbreaking, the card itself was well built and gave us some confidence in Acer's ability to put together a good GPU. Now back to that Taiwan trip, we got to see Acer's Radeon prototypes and learn that the company has been working on a few AMD cards for a while. At the time, we weren't allowed to say what the large 3-fan card actually is, uh, but considering there's nothing between the RX 7600 and the 7900 XT in the AMD lineup, and that the 7900 XT and 7900 XTX are mechanically the same, Acer is in a position now where it's trying to make video cards for all three of the, the GPU manufacturers, which is pretty unique. So uh, Asus, their longtime competitor, has kind of done that, but isn't really in the ARC space as much as Acer is. They made the DG1, and we haven't seen too much since then. So Acer right now, uh, it is making and selling Intel Arc GPUs. It's making NVIDIA GPUs, but it can only sell them in pre-builds, and that's because NVIDIA won't allow it yet to sell them DIY, and it is enabled to sell AMD RX GPUs. Now, on the NVIDIA side, Acer, talking to us back a month ago, specifically said that they were happy with their designs they're making for pre-builds, and they really want to bring them to the DIY market, but they haven't been able to convince NVIDIA that they should be allowed to sell them standalone uh, and maybe that's where some market interest comes in if you all or other enthusiasts care about this. So certainly, regardless of whether you'd buy an Acer 40 series card specifically, it is good to have some additional new partners to the space who might push everyone along and create some new ideas or bring different innovations in. But from what we understand, Acer requires high up approvals from NVIDIA that might get up into the Jensen levels. And Asus hates Acer and vice versa. 
Uh, Asus also pretty close with NVIDIA, so we'll see if it gets anywhere. Up next, Intel kills the NUC. After 10 years, the Intel NUC, or next unit of computing, will no longer be developed or produced in a first-party capacity. Intel started emailing its partners with the announcement, and a few of those partners reached out to serve the home, which broke the news publicly. Shortly after, Intel officially confirmed the news. Quote, we've decided to stop direct investment in the next unit of computing or NUC business and pivot our strategy to enable our ecosystem partners to continue NUC innovation and growth. It's the business word. We're pivoting. We're pivoting. This decision will not impact the remainder of Intel's client computing group or CCG or network and edge computing and EX businesses. Furthermore, we're working with our partners and customers to ensure a smooth transition and fulfillment of all current commitments, including ongoing support for NUC products currently in market. So in other words, other companies that make NUC products or small PCs won't be hindered by this move directly by Intel. It may affect sort of the marketing and how much interest is driven by Intel directly about small computers, uh, but it's not taking away the ability for anyone to make them. It's just not making them first party anymore. So. There's no inherent restriction on making a tiny pre-built around an Intel CPU. And longtime retailer Simply NUC announced as well that it plans to continue selling these types of PCs. So Serve the Home observed that it likely doesn't make sense for Intel to compete with OEMs whose entire business model is manufacturing and selling complete systems. And we agree with that because while Intel NUCs like Beast Canyon were interesting and at times mechanically impressive, as we showed, they usually carried enough of a price premium that it was hard to recommend them from a value perspective. You had to really want that form factor to buy into it because otherwise Intel's own partners could compete at lower cost by making something less complex. But the Halo products have a place too, and they were actually the entire reason we covered the NUX when Intel was making them because they made the really unique ones. Now, as a side point, we have had two of those Intel made NUX fail in the last year. They both survived the entire reviews process. We put up the reviews on them. Then we put them into use in the office and we just had the second of two fail. The first one was actually the one I was using for my office PC. Uh, fortunately, nothing of value was lost, but the SSD self-destructed twice in it, and it was two different types of SSD. So you kind of get into territory where it's like, I think it's maybe the NUC. That's the problem. The second one, we didn't bother diagnosing, but we did determine it was something related to either that daughter board they had in there or the NUC itself and not another component. So uh, maybe that has something to do with it or we're just incredibly unlucky. Either way, despite Intel's size, as a company, it was never going to move as many units as Dell or HP or Lenovo. And those tier one SI or OEMs rather have the support systems and the logistics in place to, uh, to just do a better job than Intel can do at supporting the product after it's shipped out the door. Now, this move, along with Intel's departure from the pre-built server market earlier this year, are both in line with Intel's continuing efforts to cut the fat and focus on core businesses with more margin, like making processors. And that's why Intel's been pushing for its foundry business to do more third-party manufacturing and not just Intel CPUs. So they're really trying to chase, Intel was founded as a manufacturing company not really an engineering design company. So going back to those roots and trying to get uh, customers from what would typically be considered its competitors probably is the right direction for Intel. Uh, but you know, it's sad to see things like good NUC designs and Optane, for example, go away. Up next, Paylet reveals the true nature of the RTX 4060 by cutting the PCIe slot in half. So as you've likely noticed, the 4060 is a true low-end card. It only has eight PCIe lanes running to it, so it is electrically wired and pinned for eight lanes, even though it looks like 16. It's a full-length 16 slot, and they even, at least on some of the cards that we have, put all of the pins on the PCIe slot to make it look like they're all doing something, even though they're not. Just using the extra gold, but still saving the cost in the wiring. But Paylet is revealing the <laughs> the lack of pinning here because the two fan dual OC and single fan Storm X designs that they're making both have a short by eight connector. This is a good thing. If we're going to only wire half of the lanes, we might as well just use half of the slot because 
the user is then able to install them in an actual by eight slot if their motherboard has one. This frees up the large X16 slot for more important and powerful cards like a GTX 1050. No, no, that wasn't a scripting mistake. The GTX 1050 had all 16 lanes. NVIDIA. A limited benefit to shortening the connector aside, we like this level of honesty in product design, even if it is kind of just implicit. Now we're assuming NVIDIA would prefer all of its customers, all of its board partners, have a full length PCIe design because it allows them to continue sort of manipulating the customer, the end user, into thinking that these $300 cards are mid-range and not actually just low end, which is basically how they're built. So at least Paylet is doing something useful with the limitation. Up next, Fantax is taking its already massive Fantax N2 Pro 2 full tower case and pushing it to 11 PCIe slots. It is turning it up. So the new server edition of the case is aimed at users who want a home server. It's competing with Silverstone in that market for really interesting home server boxes. And this could also serve as a workstation, anything that would have a serious amount of hardware in the build. It's kind of a fun one, so we'll take a minute to look at it. The massive case can support huge dual socket motherboards, five two-slot GPUs, 10 three and a half inch hard drives, and 15 120 millimeter fans all simultaneously, at least according to Fantex. The biggest change versus the more enthusiast focused original is the dropping of support for secondary MITx motherboards and a sideways power supply in favor of support for longer motherboards. That's where the aforementioned 11 PCIe slots come from. The server edition fittingly drops all RGB, but is available with a tempered glass side panel if you really want to see the parts inside the case anyway. We would recommend the solid panel version though, because what we noticed was one of the coolest features just requires it. There's a triple fan mount tray that can be placed on the left side panel to bring fresh air directly over the PCIe slot area, which would be useful for tightly packed GPUs that use axial fans like Fantex shows here if you're not using blower fans. It'd also be useful for the three thicker aftermarket cards that Fantex shows. That said, it looks like exceptionally tall GPUs like the Strix 4090s pictured here are large enough to block both the side mount and internal mount positions of the extra fan bracket. Other notable accessories include a built-in multi-GPU support bracket and a PSU adapter kit that allows for installation of server-style redundant PSUs. Water cooling support is predictably broad as well because you can place triple or quad 120 radiators in the front, top, and right side. And according to Fantax, the case will be available sometime this month for $170 for the tempered glass version and 160 for the closed version with the side vents, which again, we think is the better option. Now we like seeing function first cases coming to market. And this is exactly why we liked the Silverstone RM600 that we saw at Computex and uh, some of the other small stout Silverstone home server boxes because more people have started taking their sort of uh, effectively cloud storage into their own hands. And we've done that here where you can reduce your reliance on third-party services that you pay for monthly ad infinitum until you die and uh, instead store it locally. If you have two locations, maybe an office or even just a fireproof safe or something, you can also make your own redundant backup and try to uh, have multiple copies of it. Now, cloud storage is, of course, extremely useful and uh, universally accessible, but you can build your own servers. And that's something Wendell's shown a lot of on level one techs, and these types of cases are great for it. So anyway, the Fantax and Thu Pro 2 will be much cheaper than some of the other home server cases we've seen because they're basically adapting an enthusiast case and changing out some parts. But the more expensive ones do have other features like rack mounting, for example. So Cooler Master has launched a new version of its 12 volt high power cable and has done so somewhat quietly because it's coming out with a power supply. Its new GX3850 is shown in an image with a 12 volt high power 90 degree connector, boasting several improvements to the design. The cable going straight up or down from the card like this will probably discourage the side to side pull that's harder for the connector to deal with. And other than that, Cooler Master lists several claims about better contact and lower temperatures inside the terminals. Cooler Master says this is due to increased thickness in the metal, and our guess is that there's just a new supply of generally better terminals on the market now as well and Cooler Master decided to make use of it. That's it for this one though. Go to store.gamersaccess.net if you want to grab one of our signed mod mats to help fund our next mini documentary or large. We'll see how, we'll see how much detail we get from the fab. Maybe a large one, uh, but you can help fund that on the store or on patreon.com slash gamersnexus where we published that Patrons Ask GN episode from the last few days. And thanks for watching as always. We'll see you all next time.